Hi, my name's Pete Knapp, an Air Quality PhD student at Imperial College London. This series of podcasts is kindly promoted by the Grantham Institute, the college's hub for climate change and environment. Subscribe to receive future episodes and contact the Grantham Institute on Twitter with at Grantham underscore IC and me with at Pete K underscore AQ. This is Tipping Points, a podcast featuring interviews with people who have become environmental activists. What made them change? What are they doing now? And what do they hope to see in the future as we face possible breakdown of civilization and life on Earth? This first series focuses on scientists in the UK. With me in this episode is Professor Jeff Varga from London. Welcome. Thank you. All right, Jeff, I'd like to hear your life story in three minutes. Okay. I'm an American by birth, but I came to the UK in 1975 to do a PhD in ecology at the University of London. And I like Britain, and basically I stayed. Ended up first an academic at Imperial College, where I worked on relationships between insects and plants. And then I sort of decided I wanted to do something more practical. I got into agriculture, worked for an international organization that looked at alternatives to pesticides in tropical countries, particularly. Spent about 10 years doing that. Came back into academia, been in the University of London since then, but very interested taking from my original agricultural background into environmental things again. And I've been spent most of my career trying to help organize work across disciplines where different disciplines came together. So it would involve health, agriculture, environment, business, and so on, trying to get people to work together. When I was working um, in international agriculture, I ran a little institute that was based in Africa and Asia, Latin America. And although my home was in UK, I used to go there every, every month, I'd take some intercontinental trip to look at uh, or supervise work in these different areas. I didn't spend a lot of time doing ecological things. I was working mostly in agriculture. If I have to sort of say what was struck me most was, yeah, the rapid degradation of habitats for agriculture, you know, which is understandable in some countries where people need to grow food. But, you know, you would often see farming right up to a forest and then you come back the next year and that forest isn't there anymore. Also, the difficult situation in which people live in cities, incredible levels of pollution, air pollution from cars, um, water problems, and so on. So, and later I got involved in health issues and began to understand those better. Was there anything in particular that really sticks with you? Well, I was sort of impressed by how, how much nature there was still around, frankly, in these places, though they're disappearing. I guess, you know, it's been some years, maybe 10, 15 years since I've done a lot of traveling like that. I guess one of the things that struck me was that the trajectory that lower and middle income countries were on was unnecessary and a bit of a disaster because they were simply picking up bad habits that, that we had long since worked our way out of. You thought, well, why, why start there? Why not start with something a little bit more sustainable? And it wasn't their fault. It was at all. I don't mean to be critical. I, you know, when people want to make money quickly off a landscape, they, they do a lot of damage to it. Tell me a bit more about the, the ecological aspect of the climate and ecological emergency. Well, that, that's interesting. Actually, I'm, I'm going to tell you a bit more than that, because I wanted to say about the climate and ecological emergency bill. So something that interests me, I've gotten involved in an XR a bit, trying to get some more scientists supporting it. I've always found it challenging that it has both a climate and an ecological element. And I've had a lot of conversations with people who, you know, were involved in developing the bill. They are enormously connected, but they are also independent problems. Uh, the ecological emergency is one that's related very much to the degradation of the environment, the loss of some of the ecosystem services we depend on from the environment, clean water, clean air, the ability to have certain kinds of food, fish, and so on like that. The climate change one, I think, overlaps insofar as some of the solutions to climate change involve environmental actions that the ecological emergency also would benefit from, such as certain kinds of reforestation, the management of peatlands and other, other carbon sinks in nature. 
But there's some things like biodiversity decline that aren't directly related to climate change issues. So I'm concerned about both, but I find their association in the bill is a little bit hard to argue to other people because they are sort of different. And it almost as if, well, if we're going to do a bill about climate change, let's throw an ecological emergency as well. That's a really good thing because that's also important. But if you want to keep a simple message that you get people to sign up to, sometimes having two things that are, that are connected in certain ways but not others is rather difficult to argue. So what was it that got you in, into ecology and agriculture in the first place? I was always interested in nature. My father was a scientist. He was a geologist. And um, I started bird watching at an early age, around 14. That's fairly early to start bird watching. But I got into agriculture because um, while at university, I did some summer work in an agricultural experiment station in the US. And I found that really interesting because there was an application to it. It was in this case about pests and weeds and things like that. And I thought, you know, this is practical ecology. This is something that's really going to make a difference. So I got interested in that. And now, you know, many, many decades later, I ran into the whole argument about modern agriculture and climate change, which was new to me. I hadn't been interested in that aspect. There was a, a lot of fuss, wasn't there, about organic food? Yeah. What is your opinion on that? Yeah, I am opinionated about organic food because I've got a good colleague who's done some excellent work showing organic food is not necessarily in any way healthier for you. What's important about organic production is the way in which agriculture affects the ecosystem and reducing chemical pesticide use and reducing fertilizer use and using more natural resources like manure and predators and parasites. It's a much more sustainable agricultural model. So I'm very much in favor of organic production. But frankly, I think a lot of production systems that are not quite organic would be just as good for the environment. Does this mean that you grow your own food? No, I live in a, a fourth floor apartment. So even though I'm an agriculturalist, I've never actually been, been much of a farmer. <laughs> I read that it, uh, you've done some conservation projects around and in London. This relates to another reason I got involved in XR, which is that I you know, spent a career working in research institutions where what we were trying to do was to produce results that would influence decision makers government policy makers, you know. And I found that was a bit frustrating, partly because uh, all you're doing is providing information. Other people may or may not do something with it. But then things could change, you know. And, and around the time that Donald Trump was elected, in fact, on the day that Donald Trump was elected, I was in an ecological symposium in Italy. And uh, we all stopped and thought, things aren't going to happen in North America around e ecology. And we had a big talk about it. And we said, well, you know, the only way to really make this work is not to try to feed in stuff at the top, but to actually work with communities and people. So when I retired, I thought, what I'm going to do, which I've never done before, is I'm going to volunteer in the community and just sort of get an impression of what people feel about the environment and nature and food and that sort of thing. So I started volunteering. I live in North London. Conservation is something I knew a bit about from being an ecologist. And so I started volunteering in Hampstead Heath helping with pruning trees and things like that. And it's known that uh, GPs are, are getting more on board with green prescriptions, whereby people who have some issues of depression where going to do some conservation can be more effective even than antidepressant drugs. Yeah, that's really true. And I've read it a lot about that because that was sort of where my career came in. People don't usually think across these kinds of sectors, the health sector, the environmental sector. And this is a perfect example where if we think across that sector, we begin to uncover evidence that a nice environment is actually a health benefit. A lot of work's been done on that. I've read a lot of literature that's been produced the last 10, 20 years. 20 years ago, nobody was thinking about this, really. You had this gut feeling that's nice to get out in nature for a walk. But now there's a lot of good scientific evidence of that. Um, one of the other programs they have are for former prisoners, and they find that it's incredibly positive for people to reestablish their self-confidence after prison sentences to be in nature and to be working on managing a woodland and something like that. Is there anything in particular that you're perhaps worried about in terms of the conservation in the UK? Yeah, the decline of species here. <laughs> it's pretty disastrous. Um, 
natural areas get degraded, partly, I think, because people don't really understand how fragile they are. But the other issue that's been really clear in this pandemic is how much people will go out in nature for their own health and mental well-being. The number of people visiting Hampstead Heath increased by 50% in the last year. People getting out of, out of lockdown. And that's fantastic and really important. But that means more people go to Hampstead Heath every year than go to the Peak District or to North Wales, 15 million people in an area of about 250 hectares. And inevitably, that's going to have an impact on the nature they go there to enjoy. And people will say, you know, 40 years ago, you know, you couldn't hear yourself for birdsong in Hampstead Heath, and now you hardly hear anything. And I just find that enormously depressing. I haven't, I have noticed, and you know, people talk about it. I saw a lot more bugs, plants, butterflies, birds when I was younger. If you create the space for nature, it really does bounce back. It's extraordinary how setting aside a, a hectare or two of woodland in central London with a bit of water and stuff will come back. The only problem is if you push things too far and things begin to completely disappear and go extinct, as much of our butterfly fauna has and quite a few of our birds, then you can't get it back without big reintroduction programs. I mean, there is this real perverse, the thing that I find most perverse in Britain is um, grouse shooting. Because areas are maintained for grouse, so people can go out and hunt grouse, often quite rich people. The way that that's done is shoot all the predators, and that's why our predatory birds are rare, in order to artificially create a grouse population. I got involved when people said, the grouse are dying from a disease that's transmitted by ticks. And we looked, and of course they are, because there are too many grouse. In nature, there wouldn't be so many grouse, but you're killing off all the predators. You're creating this enormous population so that your hunters will have something to shoot at. And of course, you know, you're just disrupting nature. It's interesting in the States regarding e ecology, because it has been, um, ha it's had the Western civilization for not very long at all. And as a result, their ecology is still vastly di more diverse than it is in Europe. Do you see a faster decline in the states, in, ecolo in the ecological balance. North America and other what we would call sort of pioneer civilizations, um, where um, immigrants had come in from Europe and colonized an area, displaced the indigenous peoples, Canada, the US, Australia, New Zealand, that they still had wilderness. And they valued that wilderness enormously and protected it. And in Europe, we don't have wilderness. There isn't a, an inch of Europe that isn't managed to look as it is. Some of it's wild and natural, and that's wonderful, but we manage it all. Whereas by definition, wilderness in Australia or New Zealand or, or the US is just left alone. And that's a beautiful thing and people love it. And even if you want to go to a national park in America, you have to get on a sign-up sheet because they're only letting in 10 people a week. I think that's a fundamental difference between our cultures. They have sort of a sense of stewardship of really wild spaces that are going to be affected by climate change. They really see the difference between what is part of the world is civilized and people manage and what part is wild and people don't manage. And they're really affronted by the fact that, you know, we're destroying the bit that's wild. picked up from having conversations with people at work who perhaps think that XR are doing more harm than good? I've picked up that a lot of academics, quite rightly, I guess, are concerned about their reputation and careers if they are seen to be too much involved with non-academic popular activities around science particularly ones that a lot of powerful people think are bad. You go for a job interview and you put on your CV, I'm a member of Extinction Rebellion, and somebody asks you about that. You wonder whether that ancient professor who's asking you about that is actually judging you based on whether they're themselves a highly conservative or liberal person. And particularly if you're going into government work, 
it might be safer not to be associated with a group that some people think is radical. And do you think then that, that the reason that XR has attracted a lot of retirees is because they don't have to worry too much about their reputation? Absolutely. That's why, I mean, to be honest, I never felt that strongly about my reputation. I think I joined because I had time. Now, I do feel I've got absolutely nothing to lose, you know. Have, have you seen XR slip up then in terms of uh, the fact that they would harm the reputation of the people who are affiliated with them? I think some of the more brilliant things that XR has done, like shutting down newspapers last September, was an event where some of my academic scientist friends were probably put off joining XR for, not because they disagreed or saw that this wasn't killing the free press in Britain, as you know many claimed, but because it was just seen as so heavily criticized in so much of the media, that was a little bit scary to be associated with an organization which the you know, Home Secretary was calling a bunch of criminals. Imagine then going for a job in Public Health England or the NHS or where you are a member of an organization that is being under police surveillance and regarded by some ministers as criminal. I would not have done anything less radical than that. I mean, look how impactful that was. One of the projects I've been doing is I volunteered to help organize the drafting of a letter on the CEE bill that scientists could sign. And, you know, started out saying, you know, this bloody government isn't doing anything about this, blah, blah, blah. And the more I read, the more I realized that, yeah, they are actually doing something. They're just not doing it very well or very fast. What do you do in those situations? Do you, have a, do you bash them or do you encourage them? Quite frankly, in XR, we tend to bash. <laughs> and I thought, if I'm going to write a letter that's going to convince people to come over to our point of view, then maybe we need to be a bit more encouraging than bashing. Yeah, very interesting. But t yeah, t tell me more about the, the protest that you went to. Was it, uh, what was it like and how did you feel and why did you do it? I just wanted to see what this kind of event would be like. So we did a banner drop on Holborn Viaduct. I found myself intensely uncomfortable initially by standing out and making myself extremely obvious. I hadn't handed out a, a leaflet or a handout for, well, since I was a teenager. <laughs> and I felt quite self-conscious doing this in Holborn Station. But after the end of that, I thought, okay, I've done that. I've been able to, to do something which I wouldn't have normally done, to actually engage strangers on the street and talk to them about climate change. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised that, you know, a fraction of the people were interested in listening. And then when I joined the march, I met a lot of other XR scientists and I realized, you know, first of all, I was the oldest person there. There are a couple other real old people like me. Most people were young scientists, far more active and far more inspiring than I felt I was in that sense. And I thought that was really exciting and I really enjoyed that. Do you think that protest served its purpose? Yeah, I really think. I think it's it, that September protest, I think, got a lot of good press. Or let's say it got a lot of... A lot of people knew about it. The previous ones which shut down bridges over the Thames and things like that, there was a lot of negative feedback on those. And I think that XR got in a way more clever by having a similar public presence without actually that level of disruption. And the disruption was more targeted at organizations that people could love to hate, Rupert Murdoch's empire. So I thought that worked a lot better. But I also felt, I really did feel that XR had become, and I took part in a couple other XR marches during the year, XR had become something that people accepted was around and, and, and doing a good thing by raising the profile of this problem and keeping it on the agenda. Why do you think Priti Patel is so threatened by XR and groups who are trying to work for conservation? I think she's trying to um, capture the law and order agenda of the Conservative Party trying to own it, trying to be respected for that. And the same with Black Lives Matter, although she's not been outwardly as critical of them. Both those organizations are seen as problematic to the conservative party agenda. And, and if you can make it a law and order issue, then you can dismiss it. 
do you think she doesn't care too much about the environment? No, I don't think she cares much about the environment. I knew her when she was at DFID at the Department for International Development. I used to work with a lot. And she was not impressive there as somebody who cared much about development of the poor either. She was, um, I, my impression is that she was a career politician who was interested in the efficient running of, of ministries and their success. Have you ever felt uh, overwhelmed about the state of the, uh, things and, and where we're headed? Yeah. One of the things that really attracted me to XR was watching some videos and the amount of time that was spent in them talking about that exact issue, dealing with the grief, the unhappiness of frustration, the desperation of feeling that we're heading in a very bad direction. And it's sort of unlikely it's going to change very easily. And I find that really difficult. I find it particularly difficult living in a city <laughs> like London, because it's, you see it all the time, resources being wasted and so on. If you're out in the country, you wake up, you see the birds every morning. And, and in many ways, I like to do that. And then I think, well, then you just be running away. So uh, how do you unwind then when, when you feel that? I go out. The nice thing about London until recently, you jump in a train and you're out in the countryside in an hour in any direction. So I spend a week, a month out of London. Regarding the plane travel that you had so frequently um, when you were flying around the world to all these different countries, how do, you feel, how do you feel about that now? I don't fly. I'm a bit torn because I'm thinking, I got a son who lives in New York, another son who lives in Singapore. My brother lives in the States. I would really like to spend time in the tropics where I spent much of my career. So I'm trying to figure out how much flying I'm doing my carbon footprint. Found that first of all, it was relatively high, which is surprising because I'm basically a vegetarian. I don't spend any money outside of food. I only use public transport, don't have a car, don't travel much. But I found that half of my footprint was international travel half of my footprint. So I thought, okay, well, you've got to do something. So maybe one long distance flight a year or none. I take a train and boat everywhere in Europe. I won't fly in Europe. My wife is Irish. I go to Ireland by boat. It's so easy. I go, you know, I have a meeting in Sweden. I go by train. But that's a luxury, right? Because it, it costs a lot more to travel by train. It does. And I'm retired and I can afford it. Or I tell the people who are bringing me there, Sorry, I'm going to travel by train. You're going to have to pay the train fare. And how do they respond to that? Mostly they say yes. It's more my inconvenience because I'm on a sleeper train. You know, it's going to take me a day and a half to get there. It's fine. I mean, I love traveling trains. So, and I think most European organizations now will, will give in if you challenge them. But it is ridiculous how cheap you can fly around Europe. I mean, it's, it's obscene. Is, is there anything in particular that's given you hope for the future? Yeah, XR has given me hope for the future. That commitment and that energy. And in my new sort of life, being more attuned to communities rather than to my ivory tower, I just am amazed at how many people are concerned about the environment and climate change and interested in nature and conservation. It's just amazing how much value people have in the natural world. Right, and uh, with that, uh, Professor Jeff Varga, thank you. Okay, thank you, Pete. Music from Climate by Eric Ian Walker. Commissioned by the Climate Music Project. We communicate the sense of urgency of the climate and ecological crises through the emotional power of music. More to be found at ericinwalker.bandcamp.com and climatemusic.org.